What is going on, everybody? This is Nathan Crankfield, your host and founder of Seek Excellence Podcast. And I'm joined today by the one and only Joel Stepanik. Joel, how are you doing today, my man? I'm so good, Nathan. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm very excited to be recording with you. You know, you came out to uh, the Archdiocese and helped run, uh, I think it was a retreat, right, for them for a few days? Or maybe it was yeah, just like it was a youth minister day. retreat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The youth minister retreat. That's right. And so um, Emily told me it was awesome. She said you did an amazing job, said you loved that we're doing at Seeking Excellence. So we've wanted to have you on since then. And I think it's been a few months. So it's been a long it time. It has coming. been. Yeah. It was like in October, I think I was there. It was yeah. awesome. The people in Denver are just so cool. Yeah. I felt loved and at home. That's great. Yeah, they are awesome. I've, I've gotten to meet a number of the youth ministers and obviously people at the Archdiocese as well. And there's one person at the Archdiocese I really love. Um, <laughs> who's really one of my favorite people in the world. So I agree. I agree that they have some wonderful people here. Um, but also, man, so first, I'd just love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself and introduce yourself and who you are, what you do, and all of that. Yeah, I, uh, I talk about Jesus a little bit. I guess that's the, the main thing. That's what I tell my kids I do. When I travel, I go speak uh, places or I'm, I'm blessed to present. So I got, I got to go talk to people about Jesus. Uh, and when they were younger, they were kind of like, okay, I, they, you know, that wasn't clicking, but now they're in school and like, they're learning a little bit more about their faith. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's a little bit cooler for them. And then I'm sure they'll hit an age where it's not as cool anymore, but right now we're in like a sweet spot where that's kind of fun. That is um, cool. I work as the vice president of prayer services for this organization called Life Teen. Uh, and so I help guide a team of people that works with parishes to make sustainable youth ministry um, and help parishes create not programs, but ministries and environments where young people can become disciples of Christ um, and then go and make more disciples. Like they can become disciples and evangelists. Um, and then I'm, I'm right. I like to write books. And so I've written a couple of them. Um, and that's always a pretty big gift. And then right now I'm actually finishing up a degree through Colorado State University, wow. global, their online campus in organizational leadership, which has been really cool. Uh, I have a master's degree in religious education. So it's been fun to go into a completely different field that has so many parallels with our church and with who we're called to be as Christian leaders. And yet can be so maddening because as I'm listening to this stuff in these courses, I'm like, how are we not getting some of these things? But that's probably a concept and a topic for another day. Sure. But that's my new thing I've been excited about. That's amazing. Yeah, I remember being in uh, in college. So I had a seminary. I went to Mount St. Mary's University in Maryland. And yeah, I'm have, familiar. I love Mount St. Mary's. That's a yeah. great spot. And uh, we should we should have invoked her in our prayer before this, but it's uh, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton's feast day today. Is, and she yeah. was, yeah, she's right there next to the mount was where her, is her, where her mm -hmm. shrine is, where she's buried. Um, and she's one of my favorites. So, um, but one, one thing I saw when I was at the mount is we had a seminary there and I was in Army ROTC. And yeah. so I was like mind blown, man, at how much leadership training and like preparation I had to do to be an infantry platoon leader for a year, you know, like four years of ROTC. Yeah. Then mm -hmm. I had to go into 17 weeks or maybe it was 19 weeks back then of eyeballing of infantry officer training. Mm -hmm. And then it was heavily preferred that you go and be a uh, ranger qualified. So you got to do at least two months of that and then go to airborne school. And so it's like, from if you took somebody like straight out of college, you have to do like 18, 19, 20 months of training to become an infantry officer. And it's like, man, it's a ton. And then you learn like all these guys in seminary who are going to go out and become priests forever. Like they're, they're going to be leaders right. for the rest of their lives. And there's like, I'm like, how much leadership training and stuff do they do? And they're like, le legitimately none. Yeah, zero. <laughs> like not only like not, not, not much, you know, like none. Zero credit hours. Yeah. It's yeah, crazy. It's nuts. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, one of the things that I think gives me a lot of compassion when getting frustrated with priests at different times in my life is realizing that they don't have that formation, that they really, oh. in a certain sense, have been set up to fail in a lot of ways. And I think that's what I found to be interesting. And I've realized is that there are two things in the world that everybody thinks anybody can do, and they coincide within the church. And one is ministry and one is leadership. Like being a youth yep. minister and working in the church for so long, I know you've encountered this too. Anybody thinks it's just so easy. Like oh, ministry is just easy. I'm like, yeah, oh, ministry is hard. Right. And then leadership's the same way. It's like, well, you know, lead, like how, how difficult is that? It's really difficult. You know, like you had 20 yeah. months of training to be a leader, like, and, and it's a lifelong formation thing. And so those things, you're right. We have a lot of compassion for priests because 
its ministry and its leadership folded into one. And a lot of these guys are like, I love the Lord. And I came to bring the sacraments, you know, and to walk yeah. with people. And uh, I wasn't signing up to be a CEO of a multi-million dollar company. Yeah. And here I am. Here you are, brother. That's right. <laughs> That's crazy, man. It really is. It really is unfortunate, but it is something that I think uh, hopefully is growing and, and changing and something that we hope to see evolve. And it's, it's honestly one of my like low key dreams for seeking excellence to be uh, more of a help for priests, especially for seminarians, you know, to help train them in a lot of these different areas. You know, we have a podcast coming out with Lindsay Fullerman who does fit from faith and she has like yeah. entire fitness programs yeah, that she runs for seminarians, um, which is really great. But I, I, you know, what you said there about the importance of like recognizing how hard ministry is, you see so many people leaving youth ministry or even like focus and all these other things that really kind of lose their way when they get into the world mm -hmm. or sometimes lose their faith, even while they're doing ministry and it just becomes a job for them. And I think that we don't really emphasize grit in the way that we ought to, you yeah. know, like when, when you're joining, when you're becoming an infantry officer and you're and especially in a time of war, which we were at the time, like there's an understanding, like you're going to go through some stuff, right? Like you're going right. to see some shit out there. Like it's not going to be all, you know, easy going. Yes. And, like, yeah. and we don't do that. I feel like for you, like theology degrees don't really prepare people sometimes for, the, the hardship that they're going to face. And it's tough because like you can get trained for things, but until you see it in the field, right? Like yeah. that's a whole different thing. So I can have oh, yeah. like a whole section on pastoral care, but like, what do you do and how do you respond when you're sitting across from somebody who's like, I'm suicidal, you know, I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I'm same sex I'm, attracted, same sex attracted. Like I'm, I'm having gender identity issues. Yeah. That's a whole different ball game. That's that's different. And I think, you know, what do you do too when nobody appreciates the work you're doing? I think that's the other challenge in ministry. Like, what do you do when you get punched in the face? And uh, I don't know that they have classes on that. You kind of just got to get hit in the face. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I think it is is slightly a difference between education and formation. And I yeah. think we miss that aspect of formation of like, are you really prepared to go out and do what you're assigned to do? Yeah. You know. And, and that's a whole different thing than, do you know all the things I think you need to know? Yeah. You know, just like edu like the the all the theory and theology and stuff like that. Like, that's good. That's obviously a necessary part of yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. But, but is it enough? I think we often see that it's not, you know, um, which is really interesting. But you talked about your books. I want to really talk about the topic of humility today. Um, love, you know, Chasing Humility. I love that that's your, uh, you know, your Instagram handle and everything, kind of your theme and the title of your book. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to read it yet, unfortunately. So we'll do another one hopefully someday once I get uh, to read both of your get books. Through it. But, yeah, they're good. Um, yeah, no, I'm very excited to. But um, I actually just noticed it when I went on your website to prepare for this and just trying to get some info mm -hmm. on you. Um, but yeah, super stoked. So just want to know first, like what what was one of your motivations to to write that? So I encountered the litany of humility in mm -hmm. my first year of youth ministry. Actually, we're talking about grit, we're talking about ministry. My yeah. first year of youth ministry. My guy, I was sitting in a staff meeting with all of like at a big parish. I was at the largest parish in the diocese that I served in in Wisconsin. Wow. Um, and it was a, a really cool place. It was the only Catholic parish in town because six parishes merged into one. So wow. um, the priest who was there is actually a bishop now. He's the bishop up in Duluth. Brilliant guy, great leader, very good pastorly was able to take these six communities and form them into one, which is incredibly challenging, right? So this community has been through some stuff and they've led well in it. And the last piece they were really trying to get going was their youth program, which had been up and down. I graduated from college at 21 years old. I graduated a year early thinking I'm just, you know, all, all the things. And I get hired at this huge parish as a director and so I'm in this leadership meeting and the business manager goes, well, what are you going to do, you know, to, to help boost our youth program? Like what, and this is in like September, right? And I go, well, don't worry. Like by, by January, I guarantee you we're going to have like a hundred kids coming here and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be so good. And uh, by January, like people had quit, like adult volunteers had quit. Uh, one guy cussed me out in front of everybody um teens weren't coming wow. it was just a mess like I, I was an absolute failure and um somebody handed me in that period of time the litany of humility is like hey maybe this is good for you to pray uh 
And kind of that's, always, that's always an interesting gift. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah. Check out this prayer, right? Yeah, this probably uh, help you. Like, okay. And um, I started praying it every day. I had it by my desk. And I found, you know, when you ask and petition for grace, like the Lord provides it. And I think humility is one of those things where I've heard people say, like, when you pray the litany of humility, like God's going to give you humility. You pray for humility, he gives you that. I think when you pray for humility, the Lord just gives you vision to see all of the places where there are opportunities for humility. You know, it's not like God is wielding some big stick to destroy you. I think it's actually a far more uh, merciful thing to be like, hey, here's all the places where this already exists for you. Like, let me kind of peel pride back yeah. and you can see where, where humility exists. Um, so that's kind of how I got into praying the prayer. But I'm a pretty practical guy. And so I was like, what does some of this stuff mean? Because you pray the living humility, it's like, you know, from desire of being esteemed, from the desire of being, you know, extolled, from the fear of being calumniated, which is yeah, know, there's some a weird words. Fantastic there. word. Yeah. Um, and so I just for my own benefit, I was like, I think I can rearrange this uh, to maybe operationalize the litany of humility. Uh, and what I just kind of realized in my own reflection is everything lines up. Um with with itself you know like when i pray to be delivered from a desire the devil brings fear into that empty space right it's the parable yeah. of a man who has seven demons and he, he kicks them out of his house cleans his house but why do they come back worse than before because he never locks the door mm -hmm. you know empty spaces are where fear uh, creeps in and so you ask jesus to grant you a new desire to fill it so I pray, you know, from the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. But then I have to say, you know, from the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. Because if, yeah. if I'm not loved, then I fear that maybe people will hate me. And how do I fill that space? Jesus, that others would be loved more than I. Grant me the grace to desire it. Um, and so I rearranged the prayer that way just for my own self to be like, okay, like this is, this is a more functional way of looking at yeah. that prayer. Um, and then wound up sharing it with a couple of people. They were like, you should write this down. I was like, okay. Uh, and I pitched the idea as like my third idea to Ave Maria Press. I had a couple other ideas. And I was like, I mean, I guess I've got this other idea for this like humility. But I'm like, who wants to read about humility? Yeah. And they were like, no, that's the one. So that's where the book came from. That's, that's the that's, genesis of the whole thing. That's so cool. It's such an awesome story, man. I had, uh, I think I came across it in college. Somebody gave it to me. I had a similar experience where somebody, uh, it was abundantly clear that I would benefit from the litany of humility, you know, <laughs> in my, in my late teens, early twenties. And so, uh, yeah, I remember I read it all the time until I had it memorized. And for a while I had it memorized. I think I could get like 60% of it now, but yeah, yeah, it is just one of my favorites, man. I think it's something that people need to, it should just be a regular part of everybody's, everybody's, uh, prayer routine. You know, I know people always love and, and the, the litany of trust is very like uh, challenging and yeah. uh, convicting itself. But I think people, I genuinely do think people like avoid the litany of humility because it's like every line is painful. They do. And I've, I've had, and so I, the litany of trust from the sisters of life is a beautiful prayer. Absolutely. But I have told people like, Hey, like, I think you uh, like in, in working with them in ministry, they're like, yeah, you should try praying the litany of humility for a week. And they've come back and they're like, I just prayed the litany of trust instead. I was like, right. <laughs> And it's now not, you have the trust, yeah. trust that, you know, you can be humble. Exactly. Yeah. It's not, it's not that it's worse. Like I'm not trying to downplay litany of trust, but I think it's just become so much more popular in the same way that sometimes I think like, uh, I often talk about that in like, um, in like evangelical, or like non-denominational churches. I'm like, it's easy to get really popular, or like get a big following when it's not as, uh, you know, they don't have like the challenging things, right? There's no talk about abortion, traditional marriage, gender, yeah. any of that stuff. You can kind of avoid those things, divorce. Um, this is like, you can get a lot of people to follow you, you know, I'm sure you could, I could, like we could go oh, become mega church pastors. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Never talk about anything difficult. <laughs> exactly. You know? But uh, it's like the more difficult and challenging it is. I think it's just, a, it's, I think the litany of trust can be more healing as where the litany of humility can be more uh, of a kick in the butt, you know what I mean? Or like a punch yeah. in the throat every day. Well, it's, it's a deliverance prayer. I think like that's, yeah. that's what I realized. Like when you pray the living humility, you're engaging in spiritual warfare. Like as soon as you say the words, deliver me, Jesus. Yeah. Like we're, we're, on, we're on a different plane here, which is pretty cool, but also it's convicting. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. No, it is hundred percent. It's been, uh, it's been powerful in my life and I, I definitely still need to pray more often than I do, but, um, 
one thing I want to ask you is just like, what, how do you define humility? Like what, what kind of definition or um, understanding of it do you work off? Yeah, I think humility is knowing who I am before God and allowing that to be enough. Um, and that's kind of, because I think when I understand that, there's a couple pieces that, that come forward to know who I am before God and who God says I am is to be in right relationship with God. I'm not God. I'm not the creator. I didn't, you know, I didn't form the earth. I didn't create the laws. I don't make the rules. Um, but then also to know that as God's creation, I have an incredible dignity and worth and value that I should respect and honor and, um, and live into in a very profound way. And at the same time, that worth and dignity does not exist apart from God. And so there's the humility in it is, is it's recognizing my full dependence on who God is, that every good gift that I'm given is from God, that all that I am is from the Lord, that the dignity and worth I have is because I'm God's creation. And furthermore, through baptism, I'm his son. Um, and that, that gives me confidence in who I can be, but it also keeps me grounded in knowing that I am not any better than somebody else who is given and afforded the same dignity. Um, and that I have an, I have an obligation to use that in a particular way to bring honor back to the one who's given me everything and to whom I can return nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Legit. That's awesome, man. I think what I love about that definition too, is I think you really solve both of the extremes that you see on either side of mm -hmm. humility. Um, and I don't know, I never know what like a good term, like, I don't know, self-deprecation and pride, you know, like what, what would you consider like the extremes, but um, it really is such an interesting thing to me how uh, people really fall, like people fall on both sides of those things. You know, I think whenever you err on one, like I've definitely erred on, the being arrogant or cocky more, you know, in my yeah. life than I have like being self-hating. Um, and I think it's like almost hard to really understand how people can be on the other side of it, you know, but I think when you can really just attribute all of what you just did, you know, all that definition, just uh, being who you are in God's eyes, who God created you to be really does solve for both, you know, arrogance and uh, self-hatred, you know? Yeah. Oh, and I think that those are, <clears throat> I think they're two sides of the same coin, you know, like yeah. self-deprecation is pride because like, or false humility, I guess, any of those things, because what you're doing is again, I'm looking back at my creator and uh, I'm saying everything you made is so good, except me. Except well, that's pride, right? Like that's saying yeah. like, I've done something outside of your power. I've done something yeah. better than you. I've made myself beyond redemption. And like to consider myself, beyond redemption or not good is to look back in the face of God and say, I'm now I can, I can look at my sin and convict myself and say, this thing about yeah. me is not good. This thing I've done, but it's a whole different thing to say, like this thing I have done is not good. This thing I've done is a sin or to say I am beyond redemption and mercy. Absolutely. How much do you think that plays into, I, I mean, I think it has to play into like how much we judge other people mm -hmm. in that same way, right? Like I think that, there's this fallacy that exists in a lot of Catholics minds that, you know, perhaps I can, I can view either one of two things, either I can view other people and judge their actions, but not them, but I can't do that for me. Or right. I become this great defense attorney for myself and I can judge my actions on being actions that doesn't condemn me, but other people's actions are representative of them as people, mm -hmm. you know, and like they are bad people because of their actions, because of their sins. Yeah. I think that's, that's spot on. I think it's, it's tough. Like we, we live in a, a world right now where we desire justice without mercy in some areas. Yeah. And we extend what we consider to be mercy to the point that it is unmerciful yeah. you know, in other areas. And I think it's, it's, yeah, tough. Absolutely. I think that's where humility comes in because when I look at the faults of others or I go down like the social media pipeline or like, you know, I'm listening to this podcast right now uh, called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. And like, it's about, you know, failed leadership in a, 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 an evangelical church, right? Mm. And as I'm listening to that, it's, it can be easy for me to be like, oh man, like, at least I'm not that guy, you know, like, and right. sometimes you do that. 
but it distracts me from my own sin. And I think humility sometimes is stepping back and being like, rather than distracting myself on the sins of others, looking back and saying, Hey, I've got, I've got a plank in my own eye. Right. Um, but I think that's sometimes why we rush to that. People are wrestle with their own sin and we're afraid if we look inward at it, that we're going to go down a rabbit hole and be like, no, I'm bad, but it's not. We can look at ourselves and, and allow the Holy spirit to convict us and be humble enough to do that without allowing the devil to, to say to us, you know, you're worthless. Yeah. Yeah. It's so hard, man. I think sometimes, you know, even in like, uh, you know, in, in the gospel and Jesus tells us, you know, why do you see the, the speck in your brother's eye and not see the plank in your own? Like, I think it's important for us to sometimes recognize, because sometimes that can feel so extreme and you can think of, well, I don't judge people with specs, you know, like I judge Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and you know what I mean? And these like terrible people who I think are, whether it's pro-choice Catholics or, you know, uh, Hitler or, uh, you know, uh, like the, the communists in China, like I judge like really harsh people, you know, but it's important, I think, to even say uh, two things there. Sometimes even, even seeing the speck in your own eye in, in regards to what might be a plank yeah. in your brother's eye is still really important, and really helpful. And sometimes it's a plank in a plank, right? And we just still are not recognizing that we have our own faults. But another quote that you made me think of that I really, really love is, and I can never remember who it's from, but just this general concept of, if not for different circumstances, like I might be you and you might be me, you know, and just really realizing that. And I I think I was really, this really hit me hard the other day. Uh, I think you'll think this is interesting in in a conversation over the holidays with some family. And we were just talking about like Adam and Eve. And it was like, we were talking about like whether or not they're saints. Right. And somebody argued that they're like, like theologically there's been, it's been argued that they're like the, like some of the most holy people ever, because they really had like one massive failure, but they had so much less temptation that early on in humanity <laughs> that they yeah. really wouldn't have sinned much outside of that. Right. Um, but the the point somebody else was like, yeah, but their sin was so big because they only had one rule not to break. And it, it's like, it's amazing to me. It just really hit me when somebody said that, that I was like, you really don't realize that like you would have done that too. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think there's, it's, it's such a power. I love that, that narrative because there's a powerful allegory there too, because the spec in our eye, like sometimes isn't a speck, it's a seed, right? And yeah. like all it takes is a little bit of water for that to grow, you mm-hmm. know? And I think that's in the, the Genesis narrative, you have this one sin, right? But like in those first couple chapters, sin cascades where we begin with this yeah. with pride, I can be like God and a distrust in God. And then I fear God. And then because I fear God, I lie, you know, and I hide. Yeah. And then a few chapters later, we have murder. The first murder takes place. Right. And then by chapter six, things are so bad. God is grieved that he created humanity and the world needs to abate basically a reset. Like that's right. how quickly, you know, sin can like spiral out. And that's why I think, you know, the humility of saying, yeah, it's a speck in my eye, but who knows, given the circumstances, I'm three or four steps away from a plank. And so, right. yeah. The yeah, potential exists. Yeah, it evolves in, in very rapidly many times. But I think one thing that's difficult in that is the like the understanding of free will and like what mm-hmm. does differentiate us, right? Yeah. And it is so hard to to really like it, I think in in that in that kind of um yeah, just kind of that way of thinking of saying, you know, you look at somebody on on TV, right, and they're charged of armed robbery, right? Or you look at, you know, somebody like uh um, like George Floyd, let's say, who can be a very controversial figure, obviously, like some people held him up as a martyr, some people just say he's a lifelong criminal, you know, like, uh, people really going from both sides. And, uh, you know, there could be some truth in what both sides are saying about him. But I think it's easy to look at somebody who's like a, a, a violent criminal, right on TV getting arrested. And you can be very judgmental of that person. But it is it is one of those circumstances that their life could be so different from yours that if you had gone through all the trauma that they might have gone through, the neglect, like maybe you would have done some of the similar things. But at the same time, you would look at somebody like a Hitler and be like, well, if I was raised like Hitler, would I really have done the thing? You yeah. know what I mean? Like there is some type of aspect of free will that I think does make it almost easier to judge people because you can see in your own life things that you've overcome or, uh, you know, generational sins and things that you've broken and be like, why couldn't somebody else have done that? You know, how do you kind of make sense of that and still try to not judge people, I guess, while still like maintaining your own free will? 
Yeah. And I think that's why, like, I, I guess I, the way I kind of approach things and like, uh, there's this passage in Romans, I think it's Romans 12, where uh, there's this great section about discipleship and like really what it means mm-hmm. to be a disciple. And at the end it says, uh, you know, don't seek vengeance, but leave room for, um, for, for God. And I think it might even say God's wrath. For by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on, on a person's yeah. head, yeah. which sounds kind of violent. But I mean, I guess you can look at that as like burning coals, like, oh, that's like, that's kind of, you know, that's pretty harsh. But like Isaiah has his tongue burned by a coal, which purifies him. Yeah. And so I guess, I guess as I approach it, so much of life is free will and choices. And there are choices that other people make out of their free will that impact me and hurt me and maybe wound me to a point where it impacts my ability to make free choices down the line. And the only person who knows a person's circumstances is the Lord. Right. But what I can control is how I respond to other people and how my free choices might impact them. So, you know, when I choose to love, to serve, to respond with compassion, you know, to speak truth when I, I might otherwise desire to be silent out of my own comfort. You know, I think that's, and again, that's sort of where I think where humility comes into it to say, what can I control? What, what we mean, like my choices and my actions, especially as they impact other people. And, uh, even when I want to do something, and that's why I love that passage about seeking vengeance, like yeah. by, by responding with compassion rather than condemnation, you know, when I don't know the circumstances, by um, responding without vengeance, but in seeking to remedy ills, um, I may actually, through my, the Lord, through my actions might purify a person's story. Um, like right. that might be the thing, that might be the free choice that snaps them out. Of wherever they're at so yeah absolutely and compassion doesn't mean that there's never accountability right like it doesn't no. mean that we abolish prisons you know no, accountability it, compassion requires accountability you know right um, but it makes it, it on, on both sides like compassion you know to suffer with somebody makes me accountable to you as how i'm going to walk with you but also holds you accountable to continue to do what is right for your holiness you know yeah like, I think that's the thing is like accountability is um, character is not built without accountability. Absolutely. And I think the world takes that sometimes to the extreme nowadays and mm-hmm. it has accountability without mercy and right. the accountability. Uh, a lot of times the, the uh, punishment doesn't fit the crime, you know, mm-hmm. to, to most reasonable people, I think. And when you think of like cancel culture and things like that, where people get their lives destroyed, uh, you know, yeah, we could go, we could go on a whole thing with that, but I want to talk about humility and evangelization. And so obviously pride is a huge enemy to everything. That's good. Um, but humility and evangelization is something that I've talked about a lot, um, you know, in sharing my story. So like, uh, teaching, teaching other people how to give their testimony or just giving my testimony myself, or just talking about even, even like one-on-one, not, not like big, you know, giving your testimony at a conference, but like just conversations with people, just being willing to be open and honest about your past. Because I, I truly believe that part of my like consistent struggle with sin through college and things like that, uh, and especially when I was in high school, like one of the difficulties in overcoming that was like a lot of things that I went to are people that ministered to me, like were so very vague all the time Yeah, in their struggles or just be like, you know, like I, I struggled, like life was really hard at one point, And then like I went to this conference and like everything got better. And it's like, okay, like there wasn't enough in it. I feel like for me to really relate and not just relate for the sake of relating. Sometimes I think we think that's just an emotional thing. But the other thing that can be, that can be relating is it's almost like if you were lost in Denver, right. Mm-hmm. And you call me up without a GPS and you're like, Hey man, I'm lost. I'm like, where are you? And it's like, Oh, I've been where you are. You know, like, let me actually like tell you the path of how I got out of that, you know, but when you can't identify something more specific. I think there's a real struggle in that. So how do you kind of view that like humility, vulnerability? Like how do you kind of coach people on like how much to share, when to share and things like that? Yeah. Prudence definitely plays into it, but I think I love your GPS analogy because as you're saying it, I'm like, oh, like that's a great way to contextualize things. I think one of the reasons why in my experience, uh, people get very vague with testimonies is because sometimes people are still in it. And like, I think that's, that's where humility comes into in play in ministry. When people get into ministry and we're serving in the church, sometimes there's this misconception that we've got to have everything all together. Yeah. We're still works in progress. We're still working through things, but we have to be taking those things 
to spiritual direction or to confession, uh, to accountability groups, to friends, to family, to work through them. Because there are some things that, that we're going to wrestle with that are going to be sins that, are, that we need to overcome in, through God's grace and with God's grace and God's help you know, as a part of our purification. Then there's going to be some things in ministry, though, that are fewer and far between that still exist that I think it, take you out of ministry. <laughs> You know, yeah. uh, and I think that people don't, that you got to get help for that. You need to go step back for a little bit. And I think when people are hiding in ministry, I don't think this is true all the time. I think this is some of the time, and then I'll get to the rest of the time. Some of the time we get vague because I'm still in it. So I don't want to talk yeah. about my sin or my struggles because I'm, I'm lost too. So I'm calling you up on the GPS. Hey, I'm lost. Can you help me? Right. Yeah. Lost? And then the other person's like, yeah, except I don't <laughs> right. know where I'm at. Yeah. And I think it, that's a good point. Ministers without a, a developed sense of themselves, a developed sense of self, are going to hurt people. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that that's where in ministry, people kind of and not just ministers though, like yeah. not I mean not just youth ministers like those like big end, you know what I mean, but like anybody yeah. who's anybody, which is pretty much all of us, right? Like yeah. we're living in this going from Christian to apostolic age, like we're all, <laughs> you right. know what I mean ministers out here in the world and so that's true for everybody i think you know and i think that's and that's where like why humility is a virtue becomes so critical to yeah. be able to say okay like i don't have it all together i need some help i need spiritual you know anything from like i need spiritual direction to help me do a better job discerning to i need to go to confession because i have sin that that i maybe need forgiveness for to maybe i need counseling or therapy or rehabilitation because i have things so deeply embedded in me that I, I have to be humble enough to say, I can't deal with these things myself. Um, right. I think the other thing is that if, from a humility standpoint, uh, some of the times we're vague because we just don't want people to judge us. You know, we have yeah. a fear of how people will perceive us in, in, evangel in evangelizing. And so we want to appear put together and, and like, I've never, I don't want people to judge me because I, you know, I had sex before I was married or I used drugs for a period of time or because you know, I was involved in a lifestyle that was completely contradictory to the gospel. And we don't want to glorify those things, but I think sometimes in saying, you know, this is what the Lord did for me. I mean, St. Paul, in one of his, um, one of his speeches in the Acts of the Apostles says, I persecuted Christians. Like, yeah. he, names, he names what he did uh, yep. in front of a group of people. I'm Very specific. the guy you've heard about, that's me. Yeah, yeah. St. Stephen, yeah, he like yeah. references all of that. Yeah. So, so I think, I think the humility is in saying, I don't have, I don't, I don't fear what people will think about me when I evangelize because it's not about what people think about me. It's whether or not they encounter the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel like you've had a shift in, uh, you know, I know I've had this in myself almost where it's like at first when I was young and was given talks and things like that, like I kind of liked people thinking that I was better than I was. Oh yeah. And then, and then I feel like I hit a switch at one point where I was like, now I almost share those things and like share, you know, struggles and things like, so I'm like, I don't want you to think, <laughs> yeah. you know, that I leave me because like, then there's just like this sense of, of falling. I feel like it, once you, I feel like once you've fallen out of graces from somebody who held you up on a pedestal, mm -hmm. then like next time you start seeing people elevate, you're like, no, I don't want to go up that high again. You know what I mean? Like, just keep me down yeah. here. Um, and, and, and there's a certain aspect of that, I think. But yeah, have you, have you had a journey like that or, or feeling kind of? Yeah, I think so. I think like I, in sort of giving testimony, I have realized that I need to always be aware of like, is this, it was what I'm sharing, drawing people closer to me or, you know, is it like for, to make me look great or, or is this about glorifying God, you know? And mm -hmm. I think that there's different stories that I share where even as I'm like being vulnerable, I'm like, is the sake of this story? So I think I might be on the other end of things of like, you know, am I sharing this just because it's going to make people look at me like, oh, wow, what a, what a struggle you went through. What a great person you are. Like, yeah, so wonderful that you overcame that. Or like, does this story truly point back to the Lord? And, uh, and I think I've had to be more discerning about those things because, um, just being in the world that I'm in, you start to realize how easy it is to emotionally manipulate people and yeah. how that sometimes happens. It's often subconsciously, but like, it's not the right way to minister. Right. It's self-serving. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's so big. And I think that there's a certain sense. I've never thought about this before, but like we almost have this obligation to like guard our humility. Yeah. You know, Uh, obviously you have to develop it first, you know, by the grace of God, like, like we develop all virtues, but then you have to like kind of guard it once you have it, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that one of the challenging things as you live a more public life and you speak and you, but even if you don't, right, like even at work or uh, in your family life or, if sports or whatever, you know, any, any place that you can like achieve a lot, there's a, there's a difficulty in that, right? Like you're getting a lot of affirmations, you're getting a lot of accolades, you're getting recognized for all that you're doing. And how do you think that we can go about like it really guarding our humility in that way? Yeah. I think you have to like, what's that? It's the phrase you need to like, you need to embrace the suck. I think that's the difference. And you look at like people who are really successful. I think about like athletes, I think, I think like physical fitness, and virtue really there's so many parallels in in those areas because like if you don't work on your physical health it it atrophies you know and um and i think as you age the way that you work on your physical health also has to change because your body changes as well as you get older like your your capacities go down and like that kind of stinks yeah to think for about. sure but I think virtue as you age changes too. Like you have to work differently at virtue at different stages of life. So I yeah. think there's a lot of parallels there, but if you don't continue to work on humility and, and like you said, guard it, I think that's a great, great way of looking at it. It will also atrophy. And, and I think yeah. you prevent it from atrophying by embracing the fact that sometimes humility just sucks. Uh, that was the, that's what I wanted to title chasing humility. I wanted to title it humility sucks, but that's maybe a little bit too, too harsh. Um, <laughs> Because we, it, it's not be the next fun. book. Yeah. It, it, it requires, because as you grow and you move, like, let's say you're, you're going through a company, right. And you first join a company, of course, like in your first year, you kind of expect to take some lumps. Like, yeah, like I'm going to, I'm going to get things wrong. I'm going to mess up. And it's almost right. easier because people around you sort of expect it to like, yeah, like it's your first year. And then as you, you move forward, you get more proficient, you get more confident, people start to compliment you, you uh, have some successes, you enjoy some victories, and you still have that, that foundation of humility, like, but I remember what it was like. But after a few years in and after success, sometimes we see ourselves as immune to messing up. And so then we have a moment for humility, right? Like, we get it wrong, we screw up, we... Uh, we, we blow the project. We don't do well in a talk. We, we screw up an interaction with somebody, which was a moment for evangelization and we blow yeah. it, you know? Um, and, and the Lord's like, Hey, look, here's an opportunity for you to grow in humility, embrace the suck, embrace how, how crappy this feels. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that you're wrong, like that you're wrong. Yeah. And we're like, no. Yeah. No. Or no. <laughs> or, or, you know, somebody comes to us. I, had this happen a couple of years ago. Like I had an interaction with a coworker where um, I messed up in the interaction uh, and, and they called me on it, which was good. And it didn't feel good because I wanted to defend myself and be like, no, right. I, like it, that's, that's totally not what happened. And, you know, um, and you're wrong. I'm right. Uh, but it, I'm like, no, like they're right. And I have to accept that even after however many years in leadership and I can still get it wrong. And I think that's how you guard your humility is by, by growing in it and, and just embracing the moments as they present themselves. But I think sometimes people get so insulated. They think that they're immune to it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I love that. I don't know if you've ever read or listened to any uh, David Goggins stuff, but he tells a story of his first, he was trying to qualify for the first, uh, I think it's called like Blackwater, like ultra marathon. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had to do like, like he had to have like some like hundred mile record like a hundred miles in like a certain amount yeah. of time. And he did it at like a track. And by the end, like, it's disgusting how like beat up and like he was bleeding in all types of yeah. places you shouldn't be bleeding out of. And oh, um, I, can, was, I can imagine. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And his wife, his wife was a nurse and she like takes him home into the bathroom. She's like, you need to go to the hospital. He's like, no, I'm going to sit here and like, let me enjoy this pain. <laughs> he's yeah. like, just like in the most pain you can like imagine being in, Right. And he's like, no, let me just enjoy this pain. And it's like, man, you know, obviously he's like borderline psych, uh, psycho, but uh, there is a certain sense of that, right? Of just like whether it's misery or adversity or, um, but especially in humility, right? Like the pruning that developing yeah. virtue takes, like just like really resting in that and allowing that to, to mold you, you know? And yeah. that's true, not just for humility, but for patience 
and for, for love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness, right? Like none of this stuff feels good a majority of the time, but it's, it, but it's good for us. And mm-hmm. I think that's, that's the switch that has to happen where it's almost like if, if not for the cross, it seems masochistic, right? Like how could you enjoy that pain? But I think that's the, that's the switch that every saint was able to make was yeah. that my suffering and the moments of humility, humiliation, any type of suffering, the suffering, whether it's from growing in virtue or, or physical suffering becomes an opportunity for joy because I get to be united with my Lord in a unique way. I think that's blessed uh, Chiara Dano um, was the young girl from uh, Italy who had, uh, had developed um, a, a, a terminal cancer, I think, um, but refused pain medication uh, in order to suffer more fully with Jesus. And like, and her, I think the statement was, you know, whatever you will, Lord, you know, whatever your will is for me. And I think that that's, but that's the mentality. It's like, no, this isn't pain. This is joy because I I'm close to my Lord in this moment. Right. You know? Like, so when I experience humility, I experience the soldiers beating me and putting a crown of thorns on me and, and yeah. you know, mocking me uh, just like you did Jesus. Yeah. You know? uh, and I think like, there's, that's a tough switch to make though. Yeah. It's a tough switch to make. Absolutely. Yeah. St. Peter writes that in either one Peter four or five, where he says it's better to suffer for doing good should it yeah. be the will of God than for doing uh, what is wrong. And mm-hmm. that's, that's something I think is, is really interesting. Uh, you know, I'm currently li- uh, reading a Roger Ayer book, live not by lies. And yeah. he talks about how like the world really promotes this idea that like you can eliminate all of your suffering and mm-hmm. how much that requires. I was even listening to Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson talk about it this morning of uh, that's like, why so much so much uh, messaging from the world encourages us to like negate our responsibilities, right? And even like don't have kids, don't get married, like have your life be as little like have as little much respons- mm-hmm. as little responsibility as you can because that's what's going to lead you to the least amount of suffering and the most amount of pleasure, right? Um, but the church tells us the opposite that you'll have great suffering and the more the closer you go to God, the more suffering you're going to have in this life, um, in a certain extent, you know what I mean, to a certain extent. Um, But really just, I I always just tell people, you know, we have to have these training grounds Mm -hmm. for our suffering, you know, and uh, I was just having this conversation with Emily the other day, because we have this, it's kind of funny, Uh, I'm going to post it on Instagram today, I think, because I want to share with people, because I think there's a lesson in it, but this kind of like funny podcast review that like really bashed me and Emily, I thought it was kind of funny, both of us, yeah, and uh, yeah, just kind of goes in, it sounds like they're from a different country with like the verbiage they use, Sure. like the first word just like drivel, and then it's like, uh, these two like arrogant idiots or something like Sharon, like compete for like, what's the worst content to put out on the internet? Like, it's kind of funny. Um, yeah. but it, it is, but you can tell it's genuine too. And like, I, I had this moment of thinking, like, should I read, like, should I even tell her that this exists? Like, should I let mm-hmm. her find it on her own? Someday? She's not like reading my podcast reviews. I don't even look at them that often. Um, but I happened to come across it and I shared it with her because I'm like, sometimes like those things are good. And like, I appreciate them. Cause I'm like, the, like it all it all prepares you you know for future suffering or for um you know i only think that stuff is going to increase right i always tell people when i ask yeah. them at the end of the podcast leave a review i'm like because i get i have like six one star reviews because i share stuff yeah. people don't like to hear you yeah. know and so but it's good for me to see that and to just be like humbled and be like why am i doing this and to kind of have that balance of you know it's great seeing the positive ones but i feel like sometimes people let the, the bad ones like dominate their life. But some people are the opposite, right? Where they don't care about the, the critics and they let any like positive things people say, like blow their head up and right. become super arrogant, you know? And yeah, so I just think it's really interesting, but this need to just like really use it as a training ground, every opportunity that we have to, to recognize, like I might get criticized a lot worse than this someday. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. And, and, are, and am I ready? Am I ready for that? Like, and all the little bits, and I think that's right. all the little bits of humility lead it back. And you, you said too, like, remember why you do this. I think that's even going back to humility and evangelization, you know, and sharing the truth, but that's why, like, is it for the, you know, you're not doing it for the reviews. And that's the thing. So you exactly. can look at that and say, all right, I'm going to scan this. Is there a nugget of truth in it? No. Well, at least it's preparing me for future suffering. Yeah. You know? Like, and, uh, and to, to, and to remember not everybody's going to like you and it's hard yep. and that's okay. Um, but if you're not doing it for the right reasons, yeah, that stuff becomes devastating because, yeah. then you're like, well, my God isn't, isn't the Lord of heaven and earth. It's, it's people's opinions. And there's right. a lot of people where that is, that is the God 
is what do people think of me? What do, what do people say about me? Absolutely. Yeah, man. And, and I mean, I've talked, I feel like it's kind of been a theme in like very short bits of like many podcasts recently of talking about people pleasing. Yeah. Um, but that's exactly that where, where you start to worship the opinions of other people. And it's funny because I would, the way I would tell people to guard their humility, typically, I really love everything you shared so far about that. Um, but what I used to always tell people is I'm like, you should have an, I call it the ACP. It was an army term of access control point, which mm-hmm. is basically a security checkpoint before you let anything in, you know? And it's like, you give a few people the keys, right? Just like you went to your house, right? If you trusted people, your spouse, your best friend, you know, your parents, or if you yeah. can't, right? Sometimes you have to revoke it from those people in your life, you know, but certain people you obviously give access to and you have to be vulnerable. You shouldn't be like just completely locked down a steel cage from everybody. Right. Yeah. But having that kind of like filter system, when I hear something or I read something like that, exactly what you just described it, of uh, is there truth to this? Because some, some of the criticism, it's like, I, I get criticized on the internet for things that I share or opinions or whatever. And like, sometimes I'm like, oh, you're right. I should take that down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that, that was not just funny. Like it was actually rude, you mm-hmm. know? And it, like, right, there right. is a line for that. And sometimes people think, me just trying to be funny is rude. And I'm like, no, that's just, that's just a silly joke. You know what I mean? And sometimes like, okay, I was kind of being an ass there. Um, and, and you have to have the humility, I think, to, to look at it and honestly assess the situations. And we get the training to do that in so many different areas of life. But if you don't take those little lessons uh, that build upon it, then, then you just get wrecked, you know, out of nowhere one day by a comment or something. Some, you heard a friend said about you that you didn't, you know, expect because you were like, I, I thought they liked me, you know? And you just get yeah. destroyed by a comment or gossip or something like that. But uh, speaking of other people, so I, I wanted to ask you about sometimes, I guess the best word for this that I've come up with is like presuming humility on others, right? Or okay, forcing yeah. humility on other people. And so the main way I mean that is, is when evangelizing or sharing our story or writing even, like how do you kind of discern when to share about other people who have impacted your life, right? So it could be in your testimony maybe in writing books, um, for me in podcasting, right? Like, yeah, especially certain people were sharing stuff that has happened in their family. Um, and you know that this might get back to these people sometime, but I've always kind of struggled with the tension there of the goal is to save souls, right. And bring people to the church, bring people to God. But at the same time, you don't want to, you know, just destroy somebody else's life who hasn't chosen to be public or to share their story publicly or, yeah, you know, so how do you kind of balance that, you know, going, going in your own ministry? Yeah, I think I've found that um, I am always asking, will the story that I share, um, one, if I haven't been, if I haven't asked to share it, like if I haven't said, hey, I'm going to share this story. And there have been some stories where I have, where I've looked at, where I've talked to the person ahead of time and said, hey, <clears throat> I'm going to share this story. Here's why. Is that okay with you? You know, uh, and all of the times I've done that going into it, I knew they were going to be cool with it. Uh, and so nobody's ever told me no, but if somebody were ever say, no, I'm not really comfortable with that. I'd be like, okay, well, I'm not going to share the story. Uh, if they don't know about it, I'm always saying, is this going to impact that person's like, is this insulting to that person? Am I painting a picture of this person in the minds of all of the listeners as a bad person or as a villain or as a, you know, um, you know, the, the, yeah, the, the bad person in the story. Um, and I found that even as I share things, there are some things that I can do where it doesn't make the person the bad person anymore. You know, so like, yeah. for example, uh, when I was in college, I, I was dating this girl for a long time. And uh, I started to get really much more into my faith. And I shared that with her one night, how, how deeply I was getting into my faith. And she looked at me as like, that really freaks me out. Like, I don't like that. And then a few weeks later, she broke up with me. Now in that story, it's easy when you hear it to be like, what's, what a bad person. She broke up with you for your faith, but I'm always quick to say it's my fault. I never let her in on any of that journey. I never invited her along. I never said, and so I dropped this bomb on her. Like, Hey, by the way, I've been growing and changing and maturing in ways that I've deliberately kept you out of. And now I'm going to drop all of that on you and expect it to right. Yeah. You know, like I'm the bad guy in the story, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that's sort of my first test is like, will this paint the person as the bad guy? And is there a way that I can contextualize this narrative, which is a part of my story as well, um, so that they're not? And I found that oftentimes that's the case. Um, and then I don't share stories that are not my story 
to share. So if somebody else's mm -hmm. story, you know, uh, if I just intersect that in a way, I don't share stories that are not mine to share. When it comes to family members and things like that, it's, it is tough because you're like, this story could help save people. But if I, if I feel attention in that, I ask the Lord to, usually to give me a different story. If I'm like, Lord, I feel yeah. like, something you know my good. history, <laughs> give, me, give me something different. And the Lord usually comes through. Yeah, that's amazing, man. I think uh, the other thing that that made me think of too is not only does it paint the other person as the villain, but are you with a story trying to paint yourself as the hero? Oh yeah, that's see, that's that's it. I like that because it's that's that's humility. It's, yeah, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier. Sometimes you have to be discerning of like, why am I sharing this story? Is this to glorify God or is this for for me? Yeah, yeah, and it's one thing that I definitely have seen myself struggle with at times with sharing things and. Uh, you know, it's difficult. And I think the more that you talk, the more that you speak, the more difficult you see that it is, you know, and I've struggled more and more having a podcast and thinking about that. And, and it's like, sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's really tough, man, because there's certain stuff that like I, I started, Emily was just laughing at me the other day because she had my phone, right? And she was looking at, at some picture that we took or something. And she saw I have an album in my phone called Stuff I Hate on the Internet. And... <laughs> Which is incredible, right? Uh, let me let me see. I think there's like 25 things in it. I've stopped. I haven't added to it as much recently, but um, yeah, there's there's about 20 20 different like screenshots of things in there, and so it's all like memes and stuff that I see people share, and usually I hate them, which is why it's in the album. Um, and like the difficult thing is, is I I started the album because I was like I used to take them and like want to reshare them immediately and talk about right. them, but I'm like. It's like if somebody shared on their story, or whatever, it's like it's still up on that person's story. You know, like it's very right. clear that I'm like and I'm very direct and, and uh, bold in my language, let's say. And so it would be easy for somebody to get offended if they just posted something. Um, so what I've done, I started like saving them. And then like two weeks later, you know, yeah. when this person like forgets that they like shared it, then I would go through maybe and like talk about it a little bit and just kind of dissect it. Um, but I think that that kind of stuff is so important to kind of share or just kind of find these like creative ways, you know, to try to not be as uh, aggressive or offensive towards people. I love what you said about just really discerning, like, is this story, like, do I feel good about sharing it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but even just giving credit to so many other people who have played an impact in your life, um, and obviously the role God's played in your life in bringing you out of the struggle or whatever the trauma that might've happened to you, um, I think is so important. Uh, for people as well, because I don't think the answer is to, and I've always stressed this, to never share. Right, you know? exactly. Well, especially the good things. And I think that's, again, one of the things I'm mindful of in humility is like, if I'm going to share something about something good, like, hey, this person really impacted my life. This person was so positive. And, and we do that sometimes too, which is really great. Yeah. I, I have to check myself and say, have I shared this with them ever? <laughs> oh, know, yeah. Sometimes like, that happens. Like, Oh, like if I'm going to share about this mentor I had who's so wonderful and great. And so, you know, you do that from a stage or a podcast or in a book yeah. or a blog or whatever. And then, but we never share that with that person. We never say, Hey, like, and so I think that's the other piece. Because again, it goes that's back to what point. is my intention? I'm sharing the story. Is it because <laughs> I want to give honor to that person and the way God worked through that person? Or is it because I want you all to know I have a really awesome mentor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's probably, it just made me think of Michael Scott when they're at the, uh, um, they're at, at, at like the job fair for the high school kids. I don't yeah, know if, yeah. you're, if you're a big office guy. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> he like offends the hell out of Pam. She walks away and he's like, I would never say this to her face, but she's a wonderful person and a talented artist. And, and Oscar's like, why would you not say that to her face? I have, I have heard people say, I have had somebody say that to me in real life. They were like, wow. Yeah. They were like, this person is super talented. They're so, they're so great. They're such a And they're like, I would never say that though, because I am ready for it because I wouldn't want them to get too prideful. Yep. And I'm like, but that's not up to you. You know, like exactly. That's not up to you whether they can do prideful because you and don't maybe know. Maybe they're like, really struggling with self-confidence. Absolutely. And maybe you need to say that to be like, I just want to let you know, you know, I think you're really, and you, you don't have to buff them up, but the, it was, it was, I've never forgotten that. It was like, but it was that it was the Michael Scott statement for sure. I yeah. never say this to your face. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Like, it's one of the, yeah, I think the seed's so funny, but it is so representative of so many people in the world, you know, and I've also, I've often told people about the ACP mentality of like having that security checkpoint because people will say that to me often of like, oh, I think you're doing greater. I don't want to, I don't want your head to get too big, but you know, 
but let me tell you this one thing, you know, this compliment or whatever. And I'm just like, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily feel like I need it or thrive off it because I think that the grace of God would continue to help me to continue on in this ministry, even in the midst of all the negativity and like nasty comments and things like that. But at the same time, I'm like, those things really help, you, you know? Need those things. Yeah. Like I don't need it every day. I don't need to constantly be poured over. You know what I mean? And just like built up all the time, but I'm like, you don't know what, like how much it might mean, especially in certain times, right. In certain times where there is a ton of adversity, where just things in life are not going well, right. Nothing seems to be going right. And it's like, should I continue doing this? And you find somebody that's in the midst of like, should I keep going? Sometimes that's about continuing a podcast. And sometimes it's about not killing themselves. Well, and that's, you know? and that's, that's litany of humility stuff because yeah. one of the petitions in the litany of humility is from the desire of being esteemed and you know, deliver me Jesus. Yeah. But then later on, you say that others would be esteemed more than I. Yeah. And how, but there's something very practical there, right? We can't just be, you know, Lord, help other people be esteemed more than I. I can do that. I can do that by holding you in high esteem and by giving you, pra- or I think that, you know, I can give you praise to your face and to other people. I can build you up. I think sometimes we're afraid to do that because right. it's a prideful thing. Because I'm like, well, if I share praise about you, if I praise you, if I esteem you, then like, what does that mean for me? You know? Yeah. Um, but again, going back to the St. Paul and Romans, uh, I think it's that same section in chapter 12. He says, anticipate one another and showing honor, like yeah. anticipate that you are going to honor me. And so as a result, I'm going to honor you first. I'm going to anticipate you and showing honor. That's a, that's a recipe for a very joyful life. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. I think that's so, that's so big. And just even thinking of obviously very gospel principles of like serving one another too of how much, how impactful that can be. You just made me think of this, like on humility of just like, I just had this like thought recently of like, never be the person that's like too good to pick up the broom, right? you know, or to mop the floor, to do some of those things. And just like how much, how much beauty is, is brought, not just in, in suffering, but also just in service, you know? And like, to think about the scene of like the passion of the Christ where like Mary's like cleaning up the blood of Jesus, Mm-hmm. you know, and just like the beauty that you see in that type of stuff, man, it's, it's really incredible, but humility is such, it's such a wonderful virtue, man. I feel like for so long, it was like an enemy in my life. Um, <laughs> you know, and I was like, no, I like being arrogant and cocky and all this stuff, but it really has been so, it's so freeing, you know, to not have to try to mm-hmm. please other people all the time or try to like keep up some facade or to like self, you know, be self-destructive in your thoughts and in your words. Um, but to really just kind of find that peace and like who God made you to be, man, is yeah, it's unbelievable. It's a good thing. It is. <laughs> That's a great way to summarize it, man. It's a good thing. Well, great, man. I want to be mindful of your time, but um, I'm going to obviously put links and stuff like that in the show notes, but tell, tell people where they can find your books. Yeah, you can buy my book, uh, Chasing Humility on AdamMariaPress.com or on Amazon. Um, I've got a couple other books you can get on lifeteam.com. Um, and then I actually have another book coming out in... Uh, the end of February, early March called beginning well, which is seven spiritual practices for your first year of almost anything. So if you're a young professional or you are a person who's 65 and beginning retirement, uh, this is a book that helps you not wow. only begin well, um, your, of your new endeavors, but to do it in a way that helps you spiritually grow. As well. That's amazing, brother. So that'll be Avin Press in, uh, March, 2022. That's amazing. Great. Well, we'll get, we'll have to get you back on to, to discuss that. I'll be chasing humility and then read beginning well when it comes out and then Sounds hopefully we'll be able to get you. Get thank you, you so again. much for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's been a blessing. So thank you everybody. I want to encourage you, like I said, to obviously go and, and check out uh, Joel's books and also follow him on Instagram. I'll be posting all this stuff in the show notes and the links where you can find him. Uh, but thank you for tuning in today. If you felt like this episode was helpful, for you, uh, Phil, uh, we just want to encourage you to share that with somebody else who you think might also benefit from it. Um, obviously, if you'd like to leave us a review, we talked about the one star Even review. Even if it's a one star review. review. Yeah, I did, I did do a, like a long intro recently of talking about, it. even if it's a one star, I just want more, you know, just give us more reviews, yeah. you know. But um, yeah, obviously, we, we appreciate honest ass- assessments like the person who uh, said that Emily and I were idiots. So um, always, always welcome, always welcome that type of feedback, but continue to fight hard, strive for excellence. And I'll also include a link for, uh, the litany of humility in this one as well, but continue to fight hard and be your best. God bless.